Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think we're sort of fully assembled. Uh, I'm Tim Gard. I'm, I'm the chief executive of the Nuffield Foundation. I'm going to be chairing today, and in a moment I'll be introducing the seminar and our speakers, but I probably should do the normal housekeeping announcements first. Um, there aren't any fire alarm tests planned for this afternoon, so if the alarm is sounded, we should get out. And could you make your way down to reception, out by the front door, and congregate in Bedford Square on the other side of the road. Um, if you haven't found them, the toilets are downstairs on the ground floor, just along the corridor from the, from, uh, uh, from the staircase, and there are additional ones in the basement. And there'll be a tea and coffee break at about 2.45, if we get the timing right. And uh, so the uh, seminar is, is in two halves, and the general discussion uh, will come uh, in, in two parts, uh, at the end of the first half and at the end of the second half. Um, and could we all just make sure our mobile phones are on silent? We are filming some of this today. We'll be filming the presentations and we'll be filming the responses from the panel, but we won't be filming the audience questions and answers, I think for sound reasons, and there'll be videos of this on the Nuffield Foundation website uh, later in the week. Um, so th that's housekeeping. Um, now, the reason for this seminar is this, which I hope some of you have seen. It's to launch this Nuffield study, Family Background and University Success, which um, is published by Oxford University Press this week. And you even have a discount code in your delicate information. <laughs> it's an additional incentive to buy it. And several copies. Uh, our four primary speakers today are authors of the study. We have with us Professor Lorraine Dearden from UCL's Institute of Education and the Institute of Fiscal Studies. Dr. Claire, Claire Crawford from the University of Warwick and the IFS, and Professor Anna V. Newells from the University of Cambridge, and who's a trustee of the Nuffield Foundation. And round the corner here, you probably can't quite see him at the moment, Professor John Micklewright from the Institute of Education, who will be talking about the policy implications um, in the final uh, session. Um, let me say a few words by way of introduction. Uh, let me say briefly that I think this project exemplifies what the Nuffield Foundation aims to do because it's addressing one of the most acute areas of public policy that goes to the heart of the debate about social mobility and opportunity in the United Kingdom, access to higher education. And as you will see, the data that has been assembled and analysed here is used really to differentiate, to connect, and generally untangle many issues that normally <coughs> come in a great big lump in public argument. And I think the granularity of the evidence base brings each of those issues into clarity in its own right, and I'm sure this afternoon's presentations will demonstrate that. The issues, of course, are familiar to all of us. The interlocking reasons, the huge differences in admission to university between students from the top 20% and the bottom 20% of our society, what's been the impact of increasing fees, student fees, and changes to maintenance grants, the record of success, or lack of it, among those on free school meals, and the marked differences of attainment between students from different backgrounds over the course of a career. We also deal with the relevance of examination performance and of the choice of GCSEs and of A-level subjects. And also there's less measurable factors, such as expectations and belonging, as when students actually get to university. And the study also sets out some quite stark differences between the Russell Group universities and the wider university sector. However, I think whereas the public debate usually gets bogged down in issues of access and application rates and so ends effectively in Freshers' Week, uh, this study is on to consider the relative success of students over the whole course of their university careers and indeed afterwards as the research tracks differences in outcomes in terms of jobs and income and expectations right into adult life. And so, if the book is quite tough, as I think it is, in putting into perspective the significance of some of the more familiar claims about the causes of inequities in university admissions, I think it's nonetheless quite clear that insofar as higher education as a public good is meant to level the playing field between those from different backgrounds in their chances through life, the present system is just not working well. Now, the distinctive purpose of all the field research grants is that they expect their conclusions to inform policy and practice. And here we will have some very specific policy recommendations, as well as some questioning, I think, of the lack of evaluations of some of the widening participation initiatives that are going on. 
As to the structure of this afternoon, each of our authors is going to give a presentation. And we just sh uh, changed the structure about two minutes ago. Um, <laughs> we'll have three presentations, one after the other, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions on those presentations. That will take us to our break point. We'll then come back, and Professor Bickelwright will talk about the policy implications of um, the research. And then we'll be joined by our panel, um, and, we'll be th and that will be Professor Les Ebden, Director of the Office of Fair Access, Professor Nicholas Barr from the LSE, who was Chair of the Advisory Group to this project, and Dr Chris Wilson, who many of you will know as the Co-Chief Executive of the Brilliant Club that works to boost the academic potential of students in the most disadvantaged schools, encouraging them to think in terms of a university career. So, we'll start by asking Professor Vignoles to set the scene. The study, right at the beginning, cites the very sobering statistic that half adults <coughs> in England apparently now believe that getting a degree is no longer good value for money. So Professor Vignoles begins by considering the returns on the university education. And Anna, I'll pass to you. Thank you very much, Tim. Right, so hopefully you can all hear me at the back there. Um, I'm going to be setting the scene and, as Tim said, talking about uh, the outcomes from higher education, the earnings of graduates. But I think it is also worth um, highlighting what it was that we wanted to do with this book. There are many, many questions we could ask at the moment about higher education. We live in interesting times for many reasons, but the challenges facing higher education are particularly acute. We have questions about how we fund it. We have questions about the value of higher education to society, to the economy. We have questions about how we maintain the high quality of higher education that we have in this country, uh, both in terms of teaching and in terms of research, and indeed how we regulate it. But whatever the answers to those questions, what we wanted to stress was that at the core are a set of issues around representation. If higher education is going to be successful in the broader sense, our higher education system needs to far better represent the society that we live in. And so these questions were the focus uh, of our attention in the book. And what we actually wanted to do was, of course, bring our empirical evidence to bear on this issue. Uh, so not just uh, talking about how important access is, but also, more crucially, trying to get down to the heart of it, which is, should universities be doing more about access? How can we practically improve access? Uh, and in particular, what's the role of schools in our endeavours to improve access? Further, we didn't want to stop just when we get to university, but also how do students from poor backgrounds do during higher education? What can we do to support them? And what happens to them in the labour market beyond? <coughs> And I wanted to start with that because I think it's very, very important when I'm talking about graduate earnings that we remember that the heart of the questions we were trying to ask are about fair representation. Okay, so the first and obvious question is, if we're so concerned about higher education access, uh, do we think it's worth it? Um, on average, does it pay to go and do a degree? Almost <coughs> everybody in this room, room will know the answer to that question, which is, which is yes, on average. Uh, there is still a high return to a degree in this country, uh, despite a big expansion in the size of the higher education sector. That's worth reflecting on for a moment. Where we mustn't get so drawn into looking at differences in graduate outcomes that we forget that on average, despite a big expansion, we're still looking at something that is very valuable, economically speaking. But it's also true that we're living in a world where being a graduate has changed in terms of meaning and there is far greater variation in graduates' earnings than we've ever seen before. And that's a really, really important point. It's an important point economically because we're seeing a, a greater variation in graduates' outcomes, um, and that has implications for who we pay their tuition fees and what people would be doing in the labour market. But returning to the questions that we're most concerned with, what's really important is that we ensure not just that students from poor backgrounds have access to higher education, but that they have access to the kinds of higher education that leads to good economic outcomes. And so that's why we think it's very important that we focus on uh, variation in graduates' outcomes, and in particular how that varies by socioeconomic background. We certainly don't think it's enough just to look at the average return to a degree. And it's at this point I wanted to add, I wouldn't describe it as a caveat, but a very important point. We're talking in a moment about graduates' earnings, the outcomes from higher education measured economically speaking. Um, I'm sure everybody in the room realises that is by no means the only outcome from higher education. 
but it is an important outcome. And it's particularly an important outcome for the kinds of students that we're talking about. And to ignore that is to ignore an important part of the factors that influence the way that students from poor backgrounds think in terms of their higher education. And the other point to make is that um, when we argue that students should be better informed about the kinds of outcomes that students experience from higher education, it really is important that we're saying they need that information. It's not the only information that students need, and it's not even maybe the prime information that they would make their decisions on, but it is crucial that students know what they might experience. So the work I'm going to present on graduate outcomes and graduate earnings comes from another piece of work, also funded by the Nuffield Foundation, uh, with co-authors, co uh, Jack Retton sitting in the audience, uh, Neil Shepherd, who's in Harvard at the moment, and Lorraine sitting here. Um, and we've done work using a unique uh, administrative database which links uh, student loan company information with HMRC tax records. So you can imagine this data as a very large data set which gives us insight into the earnings of graduates uh, after they leave higher education and some decade into their careers. So it, uh, it has huge advantages of, over many of the data sets that have been used previously, not least because it gives us real insight into uh, what graduates are doing some time into the labour market, and that's really important. So what has this work told us that's important for the debate today? Well, first of all, um, as we said earlier, doing a degree on average leads to better labour market outcomes. Graduates are much more likely to be in work. They're much less likely to be uh, experiencing low pay. And the earnings gap between graduates and non-graduates is considerable. Uh, as I said, for males, it's about 8,000 a year females about 9,000 a year. Now, I realise that what we're expressing here are just earnings differences between two groups of uh, people, graduates and non-graduates. We can't say at this stage that going to university causes you to have earnings that are £8,000 per year higher. Um, but what it is important is in the analysis that we do where we try and make better comparisons between graduates and different types of graduates, we're moving into uh, providing insights into the likely outcomes that graduates who go to that course will experience. And that's a really important thing for them to know about. Okay, so um, what do we find? Perhaps unsurprisingly, to some of you at least, we found extremely stark differences in the earnings between uh, graduates from different institutions, different types of university, and across subject. And those earnings differences are quite stark. But equally, we also found that much of the difference that you observe is explained by differences in the intakes into those universities. So in other words, uh, part of the explanation for the higher earnings potentially of a graduate from a particularly high status university, for example, is attributable to the fact that that graduate went into that university having a much stronger academic trajectory already. Um, but, nonetheless, even when we allow for that, we still see differences by institution. We also see differences by subject, and I'll show you some of those in a moment. And something that often gets forgotten in the debate, um, we also see all differences in earnings by degree class, using somewhat different data. The latter point is actually very important because if you remember, going back to those core questions that the book was trying to address, one of those questions was about how do students from poor backgrounds fair when they're actually in university? How do they progress in university? Now we know from previous work that we've been involved in uh, that they have a higher dropout rate, but we're also uh, aware that they also are less likely to get a higher class of degree. And what this earnings work shows is that um, causes them to have lower earnings once they get into the labour market. So what kind of differences are we talking about? It's very difficult to think in the abstract, so we thought some data would be useful. But apologies, it's quite a busy slide, so I'll talk you through it. So start with the easy bit. The subjects are along the bottom, and I hope you can read them. Sort of creative arts over on the left-hand side. Thank you. Creative arts on the left-hand side, uh, medicine over here. The dots here just indicate um, how many people are taking that subject. So a big dot means more people are taking it, a small dot, fewer people. And rather than just present an average earnings for these uh, different subjects, uh, we presented earnings at the 90th percentile, the 50th percentile, and the 20th percentile. So if we just focus on the green circles for a moment, because that's what we can envisage as a sort of average, um, it's what uh, graduates from those subjects are, are earning um, at the median 
some 10 years after graduation. You'll see, first of all, that the numbers are surprisingly low, perhaps. Um, there is a lot of variation in graduate earnings. What this slide does is also allow for the different intakes into those subjects. So it allows or attempts to allow for um, the fact that um, people who go into medicine are, are generally better qualified at A-level than people who go into some of the other subject groupings. The triangles at the top show the higher 90th percentile, and as you can see, some of those earnings are very high indeed. Um, when we've done this using a regression analysis and tried to take account of other factors, what we find fundamentally is that there's not a huge earning, uh, earnings difference across many subjects, but those in creative arts, for example, earn significantly less than those in medicine and those in economics. And that holds for both males and females. Now, um, we can still debate the extent to which these differences are causal, but in terms of informing students, it is important that they understand that there are at least some subject differences in terms of earnings. However, most students are probably aware that if you go into medicine, you're likely to have higher earnings. What's much less obvious, I think, particularly to students from poorer background, is that there are differences across institution. And whilst everybody might know of a particular institution as being very high status and attracting high earnings, uh, there are many institutions where students are much less familiar with whether the differences are meaningful. So this slide is an attempt to, to show you that. So same scheme as before, where the uh, triangles are the 90th percentile, the green line is the 50th, and the red uh, squares are the 20th percentile. Now what we've done here is we've taken every higher education provider, every institution, and ranked it from left to right with low earnings, low average earnings, high average earnings for the graduates. Okay, So institutions up here have higher earnings than institutions down here. We've been able to name some, those of the institutions who we asked and who are kind enough to give permission for us to name, which are most of the Russell Group. Um, and we can see, first of all, perhaps most strikingly, that at the top end uh, of the uh, <coughs> institutional hierarchy, if you can call it that, we have some extremely high earnings at the 90th percentile. So we have people at the 90th percentile up here uh, with earnings in excess of £150,000 per year, some 10 years into their uh, careers. Very striking numbers, I think. Um, here, we might think that's a more reasonable number to focus on because it's the median, we still see quite tr striking differences as you go up the institutional hierarchy. And this is after trying to take into account differences in the A-level grades of those going into the institutions. So um, again, whilst we might debate whether or not uh, going to I don't know, LSE up here causes you to have spectacularly high earnings or whether there is some degree of selection whereby people who are inclined to go into finance sector and particular types of job get attracted to LSE. What is obvious is that when you look across the distribution at all the institutions, there are big differences in median and 90th and 20th percentile earnings of graduates from different institutions. And at the very least, one would think that uh, it would be advisable for students to have uh, some prior knowledge about these differences before making choices about the, the university that they attend. Now, I think this is um, really useful to kind of give us a perspective on the sheer range and variation of earnings that we're seeing across different parts of the higher education sector. And even if we are concerned that this may not be causal, so we, we're worried about saying that LSE you know, causes you to have such high earnings, there is one really key feature from this, that this is tax data. This is what the official earnings of these graduates are. And that is what will determine how much of their student loan is repaid. And although we're not focusing on higher education finance today, we're talking about access, we cannot separate them out. Because clearly, what we're seeing with this picture is not just us focusing up here on all these Russell Group institutions and saying these graduates have very high earnings, we might also be shooting down this way and looking at the earnings uh, at institutions at the other end of the scale. And you'll notice from uh, the sort of median earnings um, down in the bottom third of the distribution that they are very low, very low indeed. And there's some lines that I haven't talked you through yet. Here, this dash line is the non-graduate median. Okay, so down here we have institutions where graduates 
are earning less than non-graduates at the median, okay? and indeed at the 90th percentile. So there are some issues there for us because whilst at the personal level, uh, attending those institutions may be very, very valuable, it's even possible that they massively enhance the, the earnings capacity of an individual who goes to that institution. That is possible. But what's also clear is that even then, that in, an individual is not going to ever achieve the kinds of earnings that would repay their loan. And as we know, we think that around about 40% of, and possibly even higher now, of students will not be repaying their, their, graduate, uh, their uh, tuition loans. And so we need to have some insight into that because with scarce resources and problems of repayment will come rationing of some kind or another. And as we said at the beginning, what we're trying to achieve is uh, a more representative, a fairer uh, system of higher education where poorer students are represented not just in higher education but also in all types of higher education. And uh, we should be slightly concerned that anything we do to the finance system could potentially impact on those kinds of issues. Okay, so what do we think the evidence on graduate earnings really shows us? Well, first of all, I think reassuringly, on average at least, uh, the degree does still offer a pathway to high earnings. Why is that important? It's important because it rather debunks this idea that if we keep expanding higher education, that automatically that will mean a degree becomes worthless. I think given that we've now had a, a significant period of expansion, <coughs> at least compared to, say, the 1980s, uh, we're confident that there is a demand in the labour market for graduate skills, and that's important. But equally, we're also showing um, that there's a lot of variation in the outcomes from higher education, and that means we need to be far more focused on the types of higher education that different students are accessing. And I would say we've moved beyond the point where we can just talk about do students go to university or not, because quite clearly where you go and what you sub uh, study will be correlated with how you do when you come out of the labour market at the other end. And so we need to be far more focused on that. Um, the other thing is um, ensuring access by uh, low SES students is not just about getting them through the door of higher education. The point about degree classes is that universities have some kind of responsibility uh, in terms of admitting students of ensuring that those that they admit are also supported as they go through higher education to at least achieve the same as everybody else in terms of average degree class, for example. Now, you could make an argument that what's happening is that universities are tackling the widening participation issue and therefore they are admitting students who perhaps have uh, lower A-level grades or slightly uh, you know, uh, less qualified in order that they can achieve the targets that we're setting them in terms of widening access and widening participation. The price that, we, that they may pay for that is if those students aren't properly supported as they go forward through university, they may need additional support. What's going to happen is that they end up uh, with a lower class of degree and that impacts on their outcomes later on. So I think lots to think about and need for supporting students not just to get to university but afterwards. Thank you. Okay, so, so I'm going to sort of go back to the beginning and document the socioeconomic gaps in higher education participation and look at what might be driving that. So, so in this figure, we show um, the higher education participation for 18 to 19-year-olds <coughs> by socioeconomic status. And we measure this based on characteristics measured in school administrative data at the age of 16. Okay, so um, I'm going to focus on the, uh, the, the, the light green lines here. And you can see just under 20% from the lowest socioeconomic uh, group attend university compared to well over 50, about 55% of high socioeconomic status individuals, which is a difference of 37 percentage points. So a big, big difference. And then instead, we're... In, with the dark green lines, we're focusing on those who attend high-status universities. Now, that's Russell Group universities plus other universities with research rankings at least equal to the bottom 
ranked Russell Group University, so it's a slightly strange group. And you can see, again, that there's raw socioeconomic differences in, in participation in high-status universities. So overall, about just under 10% of uh, the cohort attend high-status universities, but there's a difference of 18 percentage points between the top socioeconomic group and the bottom. Okay, so... Um, so one concern o over the, the recent past is, um, uh, you know, what impact is, is the cost of going to higher education part of the story of why there is a socioeconomic gap in participation? And we've had lots of recent reforms uh, since uh, in, uh, the, the late 1990s. So um, there was... Uh, Initially, after the Deering Review, we had fees introduced for the first time of £1,000. Uh, they were only payable from, to those from the highest socioeconomic background. But then in 2006, we, have, um, we had um, fees of £3,000 introduced, and then in 2012, £9,000. And from next year, uh, fees can go up to £9,250, 9, and I think all the <coughs> universities have put their fees up to 9250 So there might be some concern that that's had an impact on participation. Alongside the introduction of fees, there have been income contingent loans introduced. These were first um, introduced in 2006, which means that the upfront cost of going to university is zero because you can get uh, an income contingent loan to, to cover the cost of university. So there's a question of whether it's had impact on participation. Now, from the data, this is not causal analysis, but... but um, Again, what we've done is, um, this is based on geographic, uh, where, where, where students live, we've divided up um, uh, um, participation by the sort of, the, by quintiles again, and it shows um, participation um, over the period 2006 to 2013, and you can see when fees were introduced in 2012, there appears to be no sort of relative change in the participation of, of, of by different socioeconomic groups. If anything, it's slightly narrowed. <coughs> so there was a gap at 41 percentage points in 2006, and it's narrowed slightly. So it doesn't appear that the increase in fees has widened the gap, socioeconomic gap in university participation. This is not causal, but it's all to do with the income contingent loan system that has been introduced alongside those reforms. So it doesn't seem like it's, it's fees that uh, is important. So, so um, what else could be driving it? This is just summarising what I've just said. So I'm just going to go back and uh, um, if it's not funding, what else could it be? So um, prior, I think what our research shows is why there is a big socioeconomic gap in higher education participation is basically <coughs> due to gaps in the schooling outcomes by socioeconomic background. And, um, and in the next graph, we show this. So I'm going to take a bit of time over this graph to explain what we've done. So this is the raw difference I showed you before in the previous graph. Um, so just over 36 percentage percent raw gap in university position, uh, participation. In the dark green line is something different. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. That's to do with elite universities. So what we do is we say, what happens if we control for their academic outcomes at age seven when they were in year two? How much of differences in academic outcomes in year two at school explains that gap? And you can see that it falls from about 36 per percentage points to 26 percentage points. So part of the socioeconomic gap is sort of er has arisen by the age of seven. Next, we control for outcomes at age 11 when the children are just finishing uh, primary school, and you can see that the gaps fall into around 20 percentage points. So from 36 to 20 percentage points. Then we control for outcomes at GCSEs, the first high-stake exams at 16, which everybody does. And what happens to the gap? 
it disappears. Okay, so it's saying contingent on how well you do in your GCSEs at age 16, there is no difference in participation in higher education. So it's suggesting that the socioeconomic inequality in HE access is just is driven by the fact that these kids do not do as well in school. And if we really want to tackle this problem, we need to make sure that the academic outcomes of children from low socioeconomic backgrounds need to be improved. Then we do a slightly different thing. These dark green lines say amongst all those who go to university, so, so everybody's in university, what is the socioeconomic gap in higher education uh, participation in the elite university? So if you remember before, just under 10% of the whole cohort goes to um, an elite university and, and 30, just over 35% goes to any university. Um, so of those going to university, just over 25% go to an elite university. But um, there is a 23 percentage point gap between the highest socioeconomic group and the lowest socioeconomic group going to an elite university. That is big. And when you control for <coughs> outcomes, by the age of 60, this gap hasn't disappeared. So there's still, it's around a, a, a four percentage point gap, which you think, you know, as a, the, 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 the average is 25%. So it, it's still a sizable gap in terms of socioeconomic access to high status universities. So while school results explain a lot of the difference in overall participation in higher education, they don't, it, 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 there is, it, there appears to be some socioeconomic gap in those accessing elite universities. Okay, so um, I, that, that's all I'm going to say. So, it, um, and, and Claire's going to go on now uh, to talk about socioeconomic gaps while uh, people go to university. But I think this is a salient point. A lot of the access debate has focused on what higher education institutions should do in terms to increase access. And, um, and it's clear that you know, if we really want to tackle this problem, we're going to do, do things while students are in school. Although universities could play a role in terms of getting children from low socioeconomic backgrounds who don't have high enough academic qualifications to go to university through summer schools to get their academic results up so that they can access universities. The gap is in the school qualifications that these students have and it's a really important policy issue that we have to tackle. Okay, so I'll move on to Claire who's going to talk about socioeconomic gaps while people are at university. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so you've heard so far that there are benefits to individuals from going to university and hence motivating why we might care about the gaps in access. You've also heard from Lorraine that the gaps in access are sizeable. Um, but that actually quite a lot of that story and explanation behind those gaps arises in the school system. So what I'm going to do now just very briefly is tell you a bit about what happens once students arrive at university. Are there any further socioeconomic gaps on arrival? Well, Anna's already given you the, the, the sneak preview of the results, which is yes, there are. Um, and then I'll do a similar exercise to what Lorraine did to try and explore what is driving those differences. Is it a similar story about the importance of prior attainment? And so if we tackle what's happened earlier in the school system, that will also have benefits in terms of what's happening to students once they arrive at university. Or are there further issues that we need to worry about and might need different policy solutions to tackle once students are actually in higher education? Um, <clears throat> so, as I just said, there are, there are these large gaps in access, but we know that the returns accrue to people who get a degree. Um, unlike in the United States, where there is some evidence of some um, small returns to actually going to college even for a year or so, here really the focus is on the students who get the degree. Have you got the qualification or not? So if you're more likely to drop out of your degree, for example, or not complete it, or not get such a good degree class, you're, maybe you're not going to generate um, the returns that you might otherwise 
have been able to if you were able to finish your degree. Um, and then, so that's kind of at university. There's also what happens to students after they've left university. Anna talks about um, very big differences in graduate earnings by subjects and institutions, for example. I'll also touch briefly using results from the same data that Anna talks about on whether there are differences by socioeconomic background as well. So this graph is really just giving you a, a kind of overall snapshot of what is happening in terms of socioeconomic differences. So Lorraine describes a particular measure of socioeconomic background that we're using. It's based on administrative data, and we can only really observe it for students who are in state schools. So all the figures that Lorraine was talking about are mostly fo focused on those in the state sector, or who went to school in the state sector, I should say. This figure is the same. And whereas Lorraine was grouping people into five groups containing 20% of the population each, here what I'm doing is along the x-axis, I'm grouping people basically into 100 groups. So I'm splitting all the state school students who went to school in England into 100 e in a particular year, in 100 equally sized groups. The richest or least deprived are on the left, the poorest or most deprived are on the right. And then I'm just plotting the average um, outcomes for students in each of those 100 groups. So this bottom green line is the proportion who drop out of university within two years of entering, having started at 18 or 19. This top green line is the proportion who complete their degree within five years of, of us observing them starting. And the green line, somewhat in the middle of those two colours, I guess, <laughs> is the proportion who conditional on completing their degree within five years are getting a first or a 2-1, the, the two highest degree <coughs> classes. So you can see from the fact that these lines all have gradients that there are socioeconomic differences. So I'll just highlight the, the gaps between the very top and the very bottom um, just for illustrative purposes. So you can see in terms of dropout that less than 10%, around 7% of the richest or the students from the least deprived backgrounds are dropping out of university within two years compared to more than 20% of those who are in the 1% most deprived students. Similarly, more than 80%, about 85% are completing their degree if they're from one of the richest backgrounds, compared to just about 60% amongst the poorest backgrounds. And there's a particular... Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a particularly strong gradient in terms of degree class, actually. So here's where we see the line with the strongest slope. More than 70% of those from the richest backgrounds, uh, about 73%, are getting a first or a 2-1 when they go to university. And that's more like around 40% amongst those from the poorest backgrounds. So that's just giving you a kind of overview of how large the differences are, even amongst the relatively selected group of students who are making it to university. So we already know from what Lorraine said that actually relatively fewer students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are getting to this point on the graph, but we're now seeing that there are still gaps that actually emerge after they've entered the university system. Oops. So this is just giving you a sense, as Lorraine did, of what might be driving these differences. So here I've gone to exactly how she grouped um, her students, to focusing on those from the 20% richest backgrounds and the 20% poorest backgrounds. So these top set of bars are just summarising um, the average differences between those groups. So you can see, for example, that the difference in dropout between the 20% most deprived and the 20% least deprived students is about 8.4 percentage points on average. So those from the richer backgrounds are much less likely to drop out than those from the poorer backgrounds on average. And you see similar figures in terms of degree completion and degree class. And then what I'm doing in each of the, the bars below that is adding more and more controls to see whether I can explain away any of these differences. So an as Anna was describing, is it that graduates are having different outcomes because they look different when they arrive at university? Maybe they had different qualifications on arrival, maybe they had different experiences while they were at university in terms of going to an institution or a subject that had more or less support, for example. So in this second set of bars, I'm accounting for everything we know from our administrative data 
a, the, a, the, it, that tells us about students before they went to, through the university doors. So we're accounting for all of those measures of attainment that Lorraine was describing. Um, in addition, we're accounting for a limited set of other demographic factors like ethnicity, something about the schools that you went to and so on. And you can see that that's making quite a big difference in terms of allowing us to explain the gaps. So particularly in terms of degree class, it's really shrinking that average difference between those from richer and poorer backgrounds, suggesting that actually a lot of what's explaining why those from poorer backgrounds are less likely to achieve the highest degree classes is because they enter um, with lower qualifications on average. And so that's playing quite a big role in explaining degree class, also explaining somewhat of the differences in terms of dropout and degree completion. But there are still gaps, and these gaps are statistically and economically significant. So we think these are going to matter, certainly in terms of what Anna was telling us about, in terms of how likely students are to go on from university to earn the highest, um, the highest possible. So in this third set of bars, what we've done is, instead of just comparing all students from different socioeconomic gap backgrounds, regardless of where they go once they enter university, here we're really focusing in on people who go to the same courses. So this is like saying, amongst those who go to study medicine at Oxford, or medicine at Cambridge, or economics at Warwick, if we really focus in on people who are on the same courses at the same institutions, is that allowing us to explain anything? Is that differential support across institutions or from different subjects really going to help us understand what these gaps might be driven by? The short answer is not really. So even if you focus on people who are going to the same institutions and studying the same subjects, we're still seeing gaps of roughly the same size. So that's telling us it's not really about the fact that those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are going to institutions which for whatever reason just have lower um, uh, degree class awarding rates, for example, or higher dropout rates. That's not a substantial part of the story. It's really something much more um, related to the individual and what's happening to them regardless of which institution they're going to. And I've just highlighted that finally in the last set of bars by focusing on the group of around 40 high status institutions that Lorraine was describing, so the Russell group plus those of similar research quality. And that's really just to say this is not a problem that is focused on one particular end of the sector. This is not just about a group of relatively lower performing institutions who are seeing problems of dropout or awarding lower degree classes. This is also happening at the, the institutions where um, the highest research quality um, is happening. So this is just to summarise what I just said. We see these big differences in outcomes even amongst the selected group of students who go to university. And even once we're comparing people who look the same on entry to university, who go to the study on the same courses, and even amongst those who go to the higher status institutions, we are still seeing these socioeconomic differences. So they are obviously a lot smaller than the raw differences. So those factors that I've just described are explaining a reasonable amount of those gaps, but it's not explaining everything. So the final point on, that I just wanted to make on this slide is, what that's really telling us is that when we look at the size of those gaps in access between those from different socioeconomic backgrounds, that's really understating the size of the gap if we were to instead say, well, what proportion of people actually have a degree? Or what proportion of people have a degree of a particular degree class? It's really going to understate the gap. So if you like, the problem is worse than what is suggested by even the very large gaps in access that Lorraine was showing us. Um, <clears throat> so we've shown you a, a bunch of evidence which is telling a story about the fact that there are socioeconomic differences at various stages along the path into and through university. And because of these differences, and because of what Anna told us earlier, that's going to suggest that we might expect those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds to go on and have lower earnings than those from higher socioeconomic backgrounds who have been to university. <coughs> And that's exactly what we see. So this graph is a figure taken from the same set of work that Anna was describing earlier. So it's using this very nice data which is able to 
follow those who borrowed money from the student loans company into the labour market through administrative tax records. And whereas Anna was talking about subject and institution differences, here I'm just showing you what happens what, or what the picture looks like in terms of socioeconomic differences. So this is a different way of grouping individuals to that which we've been t discussing so far. So essentially we're comparing people from high income families versus everybody else. And high income here means those who were eligible to take out the minimum maintenance loan, if you like. So they are those from the richest families who had access to the lowest loan amounts. And everybody else who borrowed a different loan amount is in the bottom group, so the lower income group. So what we're plotting here in the green line is the average earnings of those individuals from high income backgrounds across the distribution of earnings. So Anna was talking previously about comparing people at the 90th, 50th, 20th. This is just plotting all of those percentiles. So the green line is the high income individuals, the red line is the lower income individuals. This is the family income. So you can see basically that at every point along the distribution, those who grew up in a higher income family look to be earning more than those from a lower income family. So bearing in mind what I just described, where those from lower income families are less likely to access the highest status institutions and less likely to get the first degree classes, we're perhaps not overly surprised by that. Um, and I guess what I should say is this is true for this um, group of individuals where we have relatively sparse other information about those students. But we also see a similar picture in terms of data sets where we have really rich information about how these people differ. So this is telling you, I think the average gap is something around 10% of students uh, oh, sorry, 10% of earnings, high income students earn around 10% more than low income students. When we turn to this other data set, which is for slightly older individuals, we see a gap even after controlling for all of the other things that we know about individuals before they went to university of around 6% on average. So again, we're seeing some of the gap being explained by what we know about people that's nothing to do with them going to, uh, you know, what's happened to them at university, for example, but we're still seeing these sizeable gaps that remain even amongst very comparable looking people who just happen to come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. What is um, important to point out though is a similar point to what Anna was making. So yes, it is the case that we have those from high income backgrounds earning more on average than those from low income backgrounds, but we're also seeing that even those from low income backgrounds, on average, are earning more than the non-graduates, which are this grey line. So we should not necessarily infer from this that this means it's not worth go people going to university. That's simply not true. It is certainly the case that those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are not earning as much as those from higher socioeconomic backgrounds amongst the set who have gone to university. But it still looks to be a relatively good investment, even from those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, because they still earn more on average than those who haven't go to, gone to university at all. And actually, there is even work which suggests that the return, so how much, how much benefit someone derived in terms of their earnings from going to university, that that might even be higher for those from poorer backgrounds than for those from richer backgrounds. And that's to do with what's happening to richer and poorer students who are not going to university. So actually, though, the socioeconomic gap amongst non-graduates, if you like, is even starker than that amongst graduates. So the relative benefit of going to university has, in some studies, been found to be bigger for those from poorer backgrounds than those from richer backgrounds. So it looks like university is still a worthwhile investment, despite the fact that there are these socioeconomic gaps in outcomes. But I think it's clearly the case that just as we have work to do to reduce the gaps in access um, to university, with the focus being on what was happening in the school system based on what Lorraine was saying, there is going to have to be work to ensure that those who, from different socioeconomic backgrounds are able to benefit to the same extent from going to university as well. And that's both in terms of their outcomes whilst they're there and in terms of after they'd left. 
And that's what we really need in order to ensure that, that higher education is being as big a generator of social mobility as we might like it to be. Thanks. Now, um, well, a lot of material there, and the wider discussion about what we do about this, what the policy and practice interventions might be, will take um, later on. Uh, but I imagine we a number of questions actually wanted to follow up some of the data that was um, laid out before us just now. Um, so, anyone got a particular question? Yes. I remember uh, how the, those students who are when not repaying their students' loan, how much does that lower the earnings more concept of going to university for the lower SES? <coughs> so I think your question was, was about what, how does the loan repayment intersect with the earnings that low SES students will expect to get? So, um, in some respects, the low earnings of low SES students um, won't uh, have an <coughs> impact on them personally because, of course, the income, uh, the loan is income contingent. So, uh, we protect low income students from having low earnings as graduates, and that's a sensible thing to do, as no doubt our panel will say later. So, uh, we protect them from the worst. Um, problems that might come about if they end up experiencing low earnings as graduates. But of course from a public policy perspective there are two things we should worry about. One is obviously ensuring that higher education makes people productive and, and gives them high earnings, but also that we ensure fairness in uh, representation of uh, low SES students in different degrees. But what does fairness mean? As we've heard from both Lorraine and Claire, it means thinking about their prior attainment and where they are likely to end up. I follow that, but from low SES mm. who do end up repaying their loans, mm. how much does it um, bring down that earnings more concept? Well, I'm, I mean, I mean you know, so, so, so yeah. what? I mean, what, how the student loan system uh, operates is it's a nine percent uh, marginal tax rate for up to thirty years. So, so, so for every pound you earn over twenty-one thousand yeah, pounds. But yeah. in terms of your research, you would have quantified to some degree how much more low SES earns when they go to university as versus when they didn't go to university. But that no, we don't. We, we, we don't have, that. because in our data we don't, we, we, can't, we can't do the counterfactual amongst non-graduates, non so we don't, can't do that properly. The question at the back, and do say who you are when you ask it. Uh, thank you, Nick Hillman, I'm Director of the Higher Education Policy Institute. Um, I mean, it's fascinating and very data-rich, and um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I guess I'll be really keen to know from the three of you, because quite a lot of it is intuitive, even though it adds colour to the picture. Um, I'd be quite interested to know from the three of you whether there were, was one thing that really stood out that was counterintuitive for you, whether you learned things you didn't expect to find in the research. The other thing I'm interested in, and I'm sorry if, uh, I mean, there was so much in your presentation, I'm sorry if, if, if I missed this talk, but... Um, the characteristics of students are very different in all sorts of ways. So your student experience is very, very different if, for example, you live at home rather than in a hall of residence or you live in a shared house versus other forms of accommodation, or if you enter with BTEX rather than A-levels. And I'm just wondering, can you just say a tiny bit more about whether you control for those sorts of differences between students as well? Let me take the counterintuitive point first. Things that surprised you, Lorraine? Um... What, one interesting thing that surprised me, and it was on research that Claire didn't report, was that um, if you take children from exactly the same uh, background with the same results, those who go to poor state schools do better on average during universities than those who go to relatively good state schools. And that, that was quite dramatic. And were you expecting that result? Um, I mean, I think we'd certainly seen that before in terms of state versus private, yeah. um, but here, yeah, we were seeing it on average for both amongst the state system as well. So, so I think there's the evidence that those <laughs> you know, with exactly the same results that go to private schools versus state schools, state school children do better. Okay. Um, but now we saw it, it, it with um, uh, low quality state schools and, uh, and high quality. So. 
Um, so I think Anna and I both can say something about subject <laughs> from what our scribbles just suggested. So I think for me, it, again, it's not stuff I presented today, but actually, the, so although we know there are different, um, different returns to different subjects, although, as Anna will say, possibly not as many as we might have expected, we don't see actually very dramatic differences, socioeconomic differences in terms of sorting into subjects. So some low socioeconomic students pick some high return subjects, some high SES students pick some high return subjects. We don't see it, the kind of skew across the board as we might have expected in terms of subject choice and how socioeconomic differences um, interact with that as we do, for example, in terms of institution quality. So there are subjects where low socioeconomic students are overrepresented and they are high they they can be high return subjects. There are other subjects where high SES students are uh, overrepresented and again they can be high return subjects. It's not such a clear picture in terms of the subject differences. Yes, that's right. And I think that's quite interesting to reflect on because if you ask students they are more familiar with subject differences perhaps than institution differences. I mean, obviously, from our findings, what is new is that previous research has always suggested that institution uh, doesn't explain much of the variation in earnings, whereas subject does, and, and the emphasis has been on subject differences uh, to the uh, return to a degree. Um, our work would indicate that, yes, there are subject differences, obviously medicine, economics, uh, creative arts, but it's the variation across institutions that's most um, striking, and uh, we didn't necessarily expect that because it kind of counters the existing literature. Can I just pick up on one thing you all said, um, going back to the book, which, I mean, making it clear, there's, as you put it, endemic underachievement of disadvantaged students in the school system is at the heart of most of this. You also make quite careful distinctions between the um, problems facing disadvantaged, students with disadvantaged backgrounds at school, and those in poor schools. And um, I think you point out that students from different backgrounds in the same schools, you also get uh, uh, markedly different outcomes. Yeah. And that leads to some of, which I think uh, John will come on to later, in terms of some of the interventions we might take, um, in terms of uh, focusing on schools. Could you say a little bit more about that balance between the type of school and the, and the student's background? Sure, I mean, I think it, it's quite similar to the story I presented in terms of what's happening at universities, actually. So there is so sorting of individuals into universities. I showed it to you mainly in the context of the prior attainment controls, but I think actually if I'd switched those two sets of bars around and just controlled first for which course you went to, you would have seen something very similar. So there is this um, interplay between selection of students into different types of institutions, whether that is universities or schools, and then further socioeconomic differences, even amongst people within the same institution. And we see the same thing at both universities and in terms of schools. So yes, I, I think the, pick, the finding you're picking up on um, is the fact that here I showed you differences in degree outcomes by socioeconomic background, something about the individuals or something about the neighbourhoods, and we saw that the gap shrunk but didn't disappear. Whereas what Lorraine was describing is essentially you can think of it as that same graph I showed you, but once you control for people um, coming from the same types of schools, you see those relationships flip, flipping around, if you like. So it's really something important about um, the fact that the message that is being sent by the attainment people are getting from different schools is telling us something different about that individual. So maybe those lower attainers at the best schools are really being helped to pull up their levels of attainment, whereas maybe the those with the greatest potential in the worst schools are not being helped in that same way. So it's, it's that differential um, signal, if you like, that the attainment is sending that we interpret. Which later takes you to consider um, carefully those students doing very well in those worst schools. We'll come on to that. The other point that was raised there by Nick was about student experience, the very different types of student experience, and what bearing that might have. Right, did we consider that? Well, yeah. clear. I mean, one, one thing I think is worth saying is that um, it's interesting if you present um, the kind of English data that we have to people from uh, other education systems, they're always really struck by how much sorting there goes on in 
the English education system. And the sorting starts, as parents in the audience will know, uh, at primary school, about which primary school different types of children go into, likewise into secondary, and then on into university. And our university system in particular um, is incredibly graded, not just socially, but also in terms of prior achievement. On the one hand, that could be a strength of the system in the sense that it's very efficient and everybody in higher education is being taught with students who are quite similar to themselves in terms of prior achievement. But it does um, reinforce the idea that the gaps that Tim was talking about that emerge so early between rich and poor students uh, become embedded at age five and worsen as you go through the system. And there aren't many opportunities to kind of reverse those trends. And I think that's the student experience is really about systematic, long-term, endemic disadvantage all the way through the system. OK, other questions? Question back. Hi, Michael Selinski from The Brilliant Club. Um, in light of today's headlines about the Casey Review and issues with cultural integration, I was wondering whether there was anything in your data that suggested any particular highlights or successes of cultural um, groups bucking the trend or underperforming, or whether that's not something that you were able to look at. So this is an interesting day to reflect on the fact that in the English education system, you know, we, we highlight particular success stories and one is the achievement of almost all minority ethnic groups in this country and the fact that they make more progress um, than whites I guess optimally you'd like all groups to be making the same progress but we can certainly reflect on the fact that over a period of 25 years um, what started out as um, endemic underperformance of minority ethnic groups has been radically flipped around. Now how that sits with the report today about other types of exclusion is a very difficult question to answer and I'm not going to attempt to do it. Um, but I think it is important that we don't forget what's happening in the education system when we're rushing into um, consideration of other types of social exclusion. Well, we must be unique, I think, as a country in terms yes. that ethnic minorities are by far the highest uh, m much more likely than uh, uh, white children to attend university. I think, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not just that we should celebrate that because it means that, you know, decades of policy has also helped there, but it's also the fact that it, was, it reflects uh, improvements in school quality that we've been seeing in certain urban areas, particularly London, Birmingham, um, and particularly in primary education which, you know, if we weren't looking at the report today, we might be reflecting on, you know, a success in the English education system as to how we can turn around that type of disadvantage. And, of course, what we need to focus on now is how we reduce the disadvantage that we're seeing in coastal areas, um, in rural poor areas, and other amongst, you know, white working class, particularly male populations. Do you have any other questions around? I want to ask Lorraine one question, if I may. You said in your presentation that prior results don't explain away the socioeconomic gap in achievement in elite universities. Participation, Participation in, in elite, elite universities. universities. Yes. You didn't go on to say what you thought might. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I always uh, rely on the data and the data can't tell us. I mean, uh, I mean you know, it must be better connections, uh, I think, you know, school support for, uh, you know... It, the shame is we don't know whether it's because children from low socioeconomic background do not apply for these universities or whether they apply but don't get accepted. We could know the answer to that question. We've got, if we could link UCAS data, application data, to the school data and the higher education data, we could see whether it's a, an application process in which involves one policy response, it involves getting into schools and giving low socioeconomic status children better information that they should apply for these. If it's a problem that they do apply but they're not getting access, then that's a different policy, res policy response. And we do not know the answer to that question, that's a real shame, and it, it's impacting on uh, policy. But, but you just pick off the numbers there, there's one thing that you didn't mention, which I thought was fascinating in the book, is you were looking, I thought the starkest figures in the book in many sense, in 2010 you said the poorest 20% of families, uh, students of the poorest 20% <coughs> of families, 650 got two A's at A level. Of the top 20% of families, the richest 20% of families, that figure was 9,500. Now, 9,500, 90% of those 
kids went to a Russell Group University. But only 86% of the 650 went to a Russell Group University. Now that makes you stop and think. But then you think, okay, so how do you get the remaining 14% of the 650? And that is 91 students. Well, I- exactly. So, so a- 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 and the data at the moment, we can't tell. But I guess what I'm saying is, you know, is it a problem that they're simply just not applying? So, right. and, and you know, if they do apply, then they have equal, you know, equal chance. Or is it the fact that they do apply and they don't have, you know, or is it a combination of both? So and that's really important. A while ago, I did try to suggest that there was an easy way to do that, and that was. Uh, the Department of Education could write to 91 students <laughs> and write to the yeah. right to Russell Group, and then we're laughing. But uh, it, it turned out to be quite a contentious um, policy intervention, potentially. And um, there did involve, it, it did end up with a letter going to a wider group of students, encouraging them to make ambitious choices. But it did get into a lot of debate as to the extent to which we want to influence choice of institution, and also the extent to which we want to describe some institutions as higher status than others. And didn't get past that. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I think it's a good point leading on from this. Alex Murray from UCL, I mean, it's quite a remarkable achievement how now you're bringing together such large data sets with the tax and the initiative. We need to talk about adding new casts for, for more insight. What I'm keen to know about is when you, I mean, I do a bit of this, what some people call big data, which is a horrible term, I think, but when you start to bring these data sets together, the whole policy intervention question becomes a lot more well informed and I suppose my, my question is uh, how, how do you approach the use of these, these data sets to really make very focused policies and, and, and particular interventions like you just mentioned but not these big grand scale national schemes that really aren't that effective from, from, from what I see. Um, I mean, I think the real advantage of the administrative data is it allows you to be very specific about what the story is. So everything that we've described today, we're able to say with quite a lot of precision because we have everybody in the country in a, in a state school, for example. We can follow them on to university. Yes, there will be questions about whether we're picking up everyone that we need to pick up at every point along the way, but it really allows us to be clear about what are the facts behind the stories that have been kind of alluded to maybe from survey data sets or that are as Nick was saying, perhaps common sense, but we haven't actually put an, a figure on the scale of the, of the issue. I guess the disadvantage of the administrative data is exactly what you're saying. It's very difficult to get into the mechanisms, apart from the kinds of things we observe, like the prior attainment. It's very difficult to say, well, if we did X, what would happen to this channel through which we think attainment might be improved or through which progress to higher education might be improved? And that's really where we need to complement the kind of stuff we've, do, we've been doing with the more detailed survey information or the qualitative research. And we tried to do that a bit in the book, but I think you know, we're kind of quantitative uh, researchers by, by nature, and so that's where we've focused our efforts, basically. But in answer to your question, the other issue, can you use big data to drive behaviour in schools? And we'll talk about the policy implications of our book sort of after the break, but I think there is an issue around um, using the data to better inform schools' decision making as opposed to using the data as a top-down policy lever to uh, influence the outcomes. And that, I think, is in its infancy, but you could imagine that the very best schools would want to know you know, what they might be aspiring to in terms of the kinds of institutions that their students might be able to go to. And if you only have a few students who ever access a high-status university, for example, that's hard to know, and data could kind of feed that decision-making process. But we also have to be realistic here. There are lots of reasons why schools don't encourage and support their students to go to high-status institutions and that's a lot to do with expectations, aspirations, and resource. And you know, we need to work on that as well. I'm a Brian Early Intervention Foundation. Um, as I understand it, correct me if you're wrong. If I'm wrong, the, your data takes account of what people earn, and not where geographically they work in the country. So it, it strikes me as cost of living inequalities grow. That that's really relevant to this, this debate that earning a close to the median wage makes a big difference in certain parts of the country or, or it, it's worth a lot more in certain parts of the country. And I just want to ask if you can imagine ways that you could do that and if you'd like to speculate on what difference it might make to analysis. So um, that's, a, that's an important point. We do control for region of the student and the university 
Um, and that's important because you're right, you know, where you start can influence where you end up. But there's a big question as to what you're trying to um, look at. If you think that part of the value of your degree is it can take you from a rural location with limited job prospects to uh, another urban location with very good pro job prospects, then that is part of the benefit of higher education. And higher education graduates historically have been relatively nationally mobile, and now at the top end, internationally mobile. Um, and so it's not clear to me that you just want to assume that you know, all um, graduates from Newcastle University or York or Durham are going to be working in the Durham area, in fact, far from it. Um, so it, it, it's technically, it's not an easy you know, question to answer. Um, I think you can clearly see that if you are a Northern Irish local institution, your labour market prospects for the, your graduates are very limited, and we can see that in the data. So yes, it's going to make a difference. Uh, but I think you'd have to be very careful about which institutions you assume are local and which you would assume are national. Uh, you don't want uh, a university that's a, a, an internationally renowned university in the north of England um, being judged as though it was a local provider. You have to be careful of that. One more question before tea? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm a student mentor in the 14 to 18 age group. I've done this for like, since 1970. Yeah, I'm far older than I look. <laughs> okay. But a common thing that my students say to me after they graduate is that almost none of the mentoring programs that they see their peers go to before they go to university prepares them for the financial stress, which gives emotional stress, social stress of being in university. <coughs> and because they are not properly prepared, it affects their performance. They are not prepared to handle that stress. And it affects their performance. So although they have the same academic capability, because of the stress and because they are not prepared, that's so what the two terms are that. But because they are not prepared to handle that stress, it does affect their performance. I mean, I think that could be one of the reasons underlying the differences <coughs> by socioeconomic background in terms of dropout that we saw, for example. So that is that would be one of the factors that could be included in our group of things we just can't see in the data that would help us explain why we saw remaining socioeconomic differences, even amongst people <coughs> on the same courses, in terms of dropout and so on. Um, yeah, do you, do no, that's right. I mean, it's interesting that prior attainment, for example, doesn't reduce that dropout gap between rich and poor that much. Um, and presumably that would be entirely in line with what you're saying. It's financial stress, not necessarily academic stress. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the income contingent loan system and having upfront support should sort of alleviate some of that. But Jill Wyness, who's in the audience, has uh, got data on uh, bursaries given out by universities and then found that, you know, universities with generous bursaries uh, targeted at low socioeconomic students have better outcomes. And so it does help with dropout and stuff. So there is some emerging evidence that, you know, Universities taking local action and uh, alleviating stress for low socioeconomic students does have impact. So, 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 there is some evidence supporting that. Thank you. It's time for tea. Before we break, and we'll be back at, um, in 25 minutes. Just want to ask Anna one final question, which will I hope cue us up for the next session. And I'll go back to your very busy um, uh, chart, well, showing a <laughs> uh, very fine slide, but which shows the income. Uh, outcomes for students across a range of universities. And if you look at the, your research taking people from through school into university and beyond, your phrase endemic and achievement and disadvantage students in the school system, do you think endemic underachievement would be a fair description of students now going through, of disadvantaged students going through the whole of the university system as well? So those gaps in dropout and gaps in degree class are um, large, and they're not explained by the students' prior attainment. So I think we can conclude from that that the 
challenges that schools face when trying to improve the achievement of students from poor backgrounds are not that much different from the challenges that universities face when trying to do the same thing. And whenever I talk about this, I think it's really important that we do not get into this idea that somehow schools are failing the students. Uh, if we knew the technology and the interventions that we needed to narrow the socioeconomic gap, I'm sure schools would jump at it. But it's a combination of uh, you know, some resourcing issues, but it's also the role of external factors, family, community, environment, etc., that influences it. So I think it puts universities in the same boat as schools. Once you have students in your student body who come from different uh, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, you have to do a lot more work to try and improve achievement. It seems to me the significance of this research is that you are moving the debate, which in the public debate, not necessarily the academic debate, is once you get a student to university, somehow it's okay, yeah, yeah. you're uh, pulling that apart, really. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's been sort of received wisdom for a while, get them in and that's fine. And no, it's not get them in, it's get them in, get them in where and keep them attaining so that they come out the other end and support them into the labour market so that they can realise the full value of their degree. I think there's an interesting international perspective here. You know, we've talked about socioeconomic differences in dropout, but, but English dropout rates are really, really low compared to international uh, uh, countries. You know, in Australia with an income contingent loan system, I think there are about 30% dropout rates in the US. They're really so, so you know, there, there, there are gaps, but our dropout rates are in, incredibly low com compared to um, other countries. So we should put it in perspective. Okay, well, let's stop now. There's tea downstairs in the dining room, <coughs> and we'll be back. Um, take, take a question in the second half. No, you can't. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Come, uh, come on, in the second half. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you the chance in the second half. Let's go have some tea.